Hi, today's little quickie is for Patrick. Patrick comes from Belgium, a place that I hope to visit someday because my grandfather, Ferdinand van Bokstal, immigrated to Canada at the end of the First World War from Belgium, and he's told me so much about it. He's gone now, but the memories uh, live on. So, Patrick, this little quickie is for you. Patrick wants to know if I could explain as simply as possible uh, isostatics, and that is the art of positioning parts in space. The first thing that needs to be said is that there are 12 possible motions in space. There's X and Y in both directions, plus and minus. So that makes four directions. And we mustn't forget Z, up and down, again in both directions. So that's our six linear motions. And then we have six rotary motions. Each one of those three axes, X, Y, and Z, can be turned in one direction and the other. So that again is six rotary possible motions. So six linear, six rotary, and that's our 12 possible movements in space. To have a part positioned in space, you have to ensure that those 12 possible movements are positioned. And if they are, well, your part is properly positioned in space. The first thing that we have to be very clear about is that fixing a part in space is not positioning a part in space. If I take this block and tighten it in the vise, it is fixed, no longer able to move. But it is not positioned in any specific way, because I could have fixed it angled differently. It's still fixed, but it's not positioned, at least not positioned accurately. In my world, there's three basic shapes that can be positioned, and this is very simplified, but there are three basic shapes as far as positioning goes. And the first is what I call cubic shapes, and this block is an example of that. The second would be a disc shape, flat, circular. And the third would be a sphere. If we start with the sphere, it's important to note that a sphere has only one surface. And since it has only one surface, we're going to call that one surface the primary surface. A disc, and this one has a hole, but we'll imagine that it doesn't, a disc has two surfaces, two primary surfaces, I should say, and one secondary surface. So the two large flat surfaces on a disc are primary surfaces, and the outside diameter surface of a disc is considered its secondary surface. And our cube shape, well, has three pairs of surfaces. The primary surfaces, which are the largest of the three pairs. The secondary surfaces, which are the second largest. And the tertiary surfaces, which are the smallest pair of surfaces. The basic rule of positioning in space has to do with the 1, 2, 3, 3, 2, 1 roll. And that has to do with our surfaces. So let's take a look. Primary, 1. Secondary, 2. Tertiary, 3. 1, 2, 3. 3, 2, 1. Three contact points, two contact points, one contact point. That is the basic rule of positioning in space. You should always have, whenever possible, three distinct contact points on a primary surface, not both, just one. Then two distinct contact points on your secondary surface and one contact point on your tertiary surface. If you have that, 
and those points are positioned properly, well, you've positioned your part in space. Now, I know you're all trusting souls, but I'm still going to explain that a little more, just because maybe some of you are a little septic about what I have just explained. So let's look. We said at the start, 12 possible motions in space. And I've just said 1, 2, 3, 3, 2, 1 rule. Let's walk through it. Three contact points on my primary surface. That positions or controls my z-axis. So z, 1, 2 is taken care of. And it also positions my rotation around y and my rotation around x. So I have 1, 2 linear motions position at this point or control and I have four rotary motions positioned or controlled at this time, just with those three contact points on the primary surface. If I go from there and put two contact points on my secondary surface, I'm doing the back one because I don't bend the other way. So two contact points on the secondary here. Well, that eliminates what? My y-axis motion and the rotation around Z. So there goes another four possible movements. All that's left at that point, the only motion that we haven't taken care of, is a linear motion along X. And my single contact point on the tertiary surface is going to take care of that. So there you have it, proof positive. These one, two, three, four, five, six contact points on a cubic shape will position a part in space, as long as those points are themselves well positioned. Now you may remember at the start of the video that I made a point about the fact that in my world there's only really three basic shapes, 3D, and that was the sphere, the disc, and the cube. Well, if I made a point, it's because it goes with my 3, 2, 1, 1, 2, 3 rule. And if we look at this sphere, the sphere, as I said, has only one surface. And a shape that has only one surface, well, has a surface that's a primary surface. So this sphere is going to be positioned by three contact points. As we said, three contact points on the primary surface. And these three contact points uh, are all I need to position this sphere in space. My disc, and I said let's imagine the disc doesn't have a center hole, it just complicates things a little bit, but it still works with the rule. And This disc has two primaries, which are the largest surfaces on the part, and one secondary. So if we apply our 1, 2, 3, 3, 2, 1 rule here, well, we're going to want three contact points on our primary, and two contact points on our secondary. And with that, we've resolved all our motions, except for the rotation around Z. And in the case of a disc, since it has no other distinguishing uh, attributes on it, its rotation isn't important as far as positioning goes. Now, if there was a groove or a slot, well, that would become the tertiary surface and we'd have to position it with a single point of contact. Now there's a few other basic rules that we should think about when we're positioning. And one of those is that the contact points that we create between a part and a machine or a tool, a fixturing tool, should be as small as possible. The less area that we touch between a contact point and a part, the less chance we have the dirt, chips, or imperfections on the part surface skew uh, our positioning. We want this to be positioned properly, uh, and the less contact there is, the better chance that we have that it's going to be properly positioned. On surfaces that have multiple contact points, so your primary and secondary surfaces, well those multiple contact points should be spread out as widely as possible. The more distance between your two contact points on your secondary surface, the better it is. 
it averages things out. Now when you have only one point of contact, as we do in this case on our tertiary surface, well I often suggest that you position your contact point in the center of the surface and that averages out any angular misalignment of the part. You should also avoid opposing contact points and that's when you double up contact points and if we look at it here with this disc and let's say that we're going to use the central hole here as a secondary surface and that we're going to position it using a pin. Now if the pin's inserted in this disc well, it takes care of that movement and that movement. So it counteracts two linear movements and that's fine. But to be able to get the pin into the hole, I have to produce a pin that is just slightly smaller than the smallest permissible hole. Everything has a tolerance. So this hole has its smallest acceptable size and its largest acceptable size. This pin has to go in the hole, even when the hole is at its smallest. And that makes for a jig or a fixture that's going to be a little on the loose side, because everything has to be watered down. If I position it on the outside diameter, and the outside diameter and the hole had the same tolerance, well, it would be twice as accurate than positioning it by the hole. And remember, if you're producing fixtures and jigs, for accurate parts, well your jigs and fixtures should be about 10 times more accurate than the part that you want to produce. Now it doesn't have to be exactly 10 times more accurate, but let us just say that it has to be a lot more accurate than the part that you're going to be producing. Well that's all fine and dandy, and maybe even a little boring, but you know, we don't always hold parts and vices, so it's important even if you're a beginner, to start thinking that there's other ways of positioning parts than sticking it in a vise. But let's take a few minutes, go over to the mill, and take a real quick look at a basic bare bones example of positioning a simple part on a mill without using a vise. So I've set up a small fixture that's going to help me drill two center holes in this piece of steel. This is one of let's imagine 500 pieces that I have to make and I'm going to be drilling two center holes in each one. So to save time I set up this simple jig and I'll be able to drill all my holes without resetting up each time. So let's take a look at what I've done. To start with I took my block that I want to drill the two holes in and positioned it on the table and clamped it down once I'd indicated the sides to square everything up. Now, once it was squared up and clamped down, I edge found my two reference surfaces and positioned my tool directly above the place where I want to produce my holes. Now, the two holes that I'm producing are symmetrical about the center of the part, so I'm going to be able to drill both holes just by turning the part around. So now I'm going to remove my part so we can see what I did back here. Once my part was well positioned, I positioned these three 1, 2, 3 blocks so that their edges came and abutted up against my part. Two contact points on my secondary and one contact point on my tertiary side. I'm not going to make a case about the three contact points on the primary. This part just isn't accurate enough to justify the setup of making three contact points. So this will do just fine. This is all clamped up and when I set my part in there, it's quite stable and well positioned. Well there you have it, the two center holes are produced and if I really did have 500 parts to produce, well this would really speed things up. So Patrick, 
I hope this answers your question. And to everyone out there, happy machining. And he